Welcome to Keeping at Marion. I'm Father Thaddeus. And I'm Father Timothy. We are two Marian priests, and together with you, we join Mary in keeping the Word of God and the events of our daily lives, pondering them in our hearts. Today, we are keeping at Marian by discussing the second part of the second chapter of St. Luke, where he mentions that Our Lady held these things in her heart. I know in the last episode, we only got to the first instance. Right, which, with the shepherds. Typical for me, I want to expound a lot <laughs> on just one particular episode. So, Father Tim, do you want to read the second and explain where we find it? Certainly. Uh, this comes from Luke chapter 2 uh, once again, but this is now verses 41 through 52. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went according to the custom, and when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the company, they went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. And he said to them, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Thank you for reading that. So that would be the fifth joyful mystery for most of us, the finding of Jesus in the temple. Uh, what we read last time would have been the third joyful mystery, the nativity of Jesus in Bethlehem. And I point that out before we delve into these particular texts today. That's how, on a daily basis, we do keep it Marian, because the rosary is a very basic way of participating in this activity of Our Lady. Uh, something John Paul II says in his letter, Rosarium Virginis Mariae, the Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he says that meditating on these mysteries, it's not just us alone, but as it were with Mary. It is, as it were, partaking in her interior practice of meditating on these mysteries of Christ's life. And just the word mystery, I mean, when I say the word mystery, Tim, what, what does that evoke in you? Well, no longer, but back in the days of my early Catholicism, when I was becoming Catholic uh, just over a decade ago, yes, when I would hear the word mystery, I would think of like a murder mystery, <laughs> something to be solved. Um, but of course, now I understand that, that, that there's, well, with not only this word, but many words, there's lots of nuances to that word and a deeper understanding. So why don't you explain to us what the church means when it talks about these mysteries? Yeah, I, I like asking that question because your answer is what I think many of us yes. in English today, we think of Sherlock Holmes, you know, sure. things that are unknown and you got to put pieces together. Uh, mystery, there's a lot of history to it in the Greek. Uh, it comes from the Greek word simply for hidden. So there is something hidden, like in murder mysteries, uh, but God is a God who reveals but God reveals by layers, as it were. There's the bluntly obvious, so the Pharisees could see Jesus, but clearly they didn't capture the full mystery of Jesus because even if they saw him in the flesh, uh, they didn't really believe. They didn't get below the surface, as it were. And in the same thing, when we read the gospel like you did, we got it this last time, I think, that you know, we can just get used to the idea of, oh yeah, you know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and we get we know the, the historical facts. Right. And the idea of mysteries is that there's a lot more to it, kind of like onions. Yeah. Uh, you know, you keep peeling away. That's and sometimes right. crying while you're doing it. Sure, sure. <laughs> but um, the idea of mysteries in the Greek is that there's a lot to unpack that God wants to reveal, not just what happened, but he wants to reveal himself and sure. go through it. And I think even more than last episode where we had the nativity, 
this episode with Jesus really gets to this idea of mystery. God's revealing himself uh, with a, a dose of humor. So I know these are sacred things. I, sure. I play lightly or I play gently with these things. But, you know, when she said, did you not know that I must be there? And, you know, it, if I were, I know, I'm a sinner. If I were in Mary's shoes or Joseph's shoes, I would say, well, no, I didn't just know that. I've been looking for you quite anxiously. So, <laughs> but clearly here, Jesus is revealing right. something more. And it's about, as it were, placing ourselves there with Mary to be able to experience these human realities that reveal the divine uh, and being able to piece it together. There's a quote, I'm not sure I'll find it uh, right here on my iPad right now, but Pope Benedict used the beautiful idea that pondering these things with Mary is kind of like a mosaic. Mm. My dad, uh, closer to his death in 2005, adopted a habit from my grandmother of putting mosaics together. Now he He's no Michelangelo, uh, but he tried and It's a beautiful image because it takes a lot of time. You know, not only do you have to have this image in your mind, right? but then you have to recreate it with these little pieces or pebbles. And and that's what Pope Benedict said. Like Our Lady, when she's holding these things, these words of God, she's putting together a mosaic. Yeah. And it, it's a great idea because it requires our participation. You know, there's what actually just happens outside of our control. But then there's also part of it that requires our own participation, our own thought process. So I wanted to start with that just because uh, we're not proposing something that's, I think, extraneous to what most Christians or Catholics do and praying the rosary. That's what we already do. That's right. No, a couple of things come to mind is, you know, one thing that the the rosary is good at doing many things, but... Um, one of the beautiful aspects of, of praying the rosary isn't just delving into the scriptures, but just the very act of saying, I'm going to take this next 20 minutes, this next 30 minutes, I'm going to slow down. You know, it's not that you're putting your life on pause so much as you're just, okay, now this time belongs to God. This is between, you know, me and Our Lady. Um, and when you mentioned the mosaic and, and the slowness of, of, you know, putting each of the pieces methodically there, it brought to mind one time I, I uh, uh, took a class on, on painting icons. And That's right. I think I remember it, when you did that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I've always loved art. But what I found was a lot of the students struggled because they weren't willing to go slow. And it wasn't <laughs> like I was an excellent artist, but it was like I understood that in order to go ahead and get the color just right, to, to, to get the, the hue that you're looking for, um, to go ahead and go in a nice, you know, elegant line, that the, the, the most important thing is patience. You know, we hear that labored all the time, you know, patience, 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 and I ain't got time for that. You know, it's kind of, <laughs> that's the point is, you know, there's there's all kinds of things that we need to kind of prioritize mm-hmm. in life. But but giving certain times throughout our day mm-hmm. to be able to go ahead and slow back down um, is, is really one of the uh, probably most necessary things in our current culture that just seems to be going faster and faster. Uh, so that's like the first thing, yep. you know, that comes to mind is, is, uh, just the importance and really beauty when you do that. And of course, again, not just with the rosary, but with scripture, right. You know, uh, so often we can just speed through the reading of the thing and, you know, it might give us some happy feelings or whatever, but, um, instead of just kind of sitting on those particular verses, especially ones that might be mysterious, right. Where there's a hidden meaning there, um, that the Lord might be calling us to go deeper and deeper. Yeah. So what your comments bring a few things to mind. One is uh, I remember listening to recorded lectures from Scott Hahn. You know, mm. Nice to be able to have him as a neighbor here on our street. And he was talking about the Gospel of John and how sometimes there's quick jumps. Mm. You know, Jesus finds Nathaniel and then Nathaniel says one line. He's like, hey, you're the king of Israel. And Scott Hahn's like, whoa, 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 wait, you just met the guy. How, right. how do you jump from that to this? Yeah. And his point, what you're saying is, we need to take this, we need to slow down because we just, we're used to like, oh yeah, you know, Jesus is the Messiah, the King of Israel, and we just trot along. It's like, no, we need pause, wait, stop. And 
that connects to the other thought that came to my mind as you were talking is, you know, there's a lot of internal activity in Our Lady. And today, you know, you were talking about, we don't have time for patience. Uh, we don't have time for activity that's not just hustle and bustle sometimes. Like if you're not just doing something, if you're not being productive. And yet, you know, here we have Our Lady who's the most productive person. She changed the history of the world. And yet, she didn't have a time machine, you know, or time slot machine to show, like, I got it at nine and I work until five. You know, surely she did work, but, you know, here she affected change in all of history, but not because she's just doing a lot. And when the line about that I mentioned of Our Lady uh, or Jesus asking, you know, Mary and Joseph, mm. do you not know? You know, I think how many times in our lives, too, when, when we don't have this attitude of our lady to stop and, and to really enter into the mystery of our lives, because we're so used to today when everything's scientifically explained. We know everything must have an explanation and some way to finagle it and fix it, to manipulate it how we want it. And these are moments where we ask, like, wait, wh what's going on? <laughs> Why does it have to be this way? And, you know, Jesus, many times in my experience like this with what you read, he does the unexpected and, and he kind of shatters our plans uh, and our expectations and moves us out of the pre-planned program that we have in our minds. And, you know, he asks, well, didn't you understand? Well, no, <laughs> I didn't understand. And, and largely because, you know, unlike Our Lady, we're sinners, we don't understand the Word of God. We're not praying with it. And so we don't put two and two together. And I found time and again in my life, I've had to stop and, like you say, slow down uh, because my plan is usually not God's plan. It's right. another way to describe God's will. You know, we talk <clears throat> about God's will, our will. My plan is often uh, not his plan. So in terms of this particular verse, uh, why don't we start with that, you know, where Mary responds. You, you have the line, maybe you can read it again, that she and Joseph were looking for Jesus anxiously. Yeah, the first thing she says when they find the child Jesus is son why have you treated us so? <laughs> what a line. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, why are you behaving this way? You yeah. know, it's, uh, and then of course she follows up, you know, behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of the church fathers, this is well before the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, mm -hmm. but they even interpreted this as a sin on Mary's sure. part. Now, we know now that Mary didn't sin ever. Uh, but one can understand by the, this kind of statement, but it's a good thing to, I don't know, struggle with, but sure. to kind of chew on because you know, what is it like to be immaculate, sinless, and yet Our Lady clearly says that she was anxiously looking. And, and later, I think Luke says, uh, you know, they didn't understand his response. Uh, and I can only imagine a, a panoply of human emotions that they must have had. I mean, sure. I, I don't have any kids, but I can imagine if uh, you're traveling and your kid is... No, no longer not just with you, but not with family members and in a different city. Uh, and you're also aware that, oh, this is the Messiah, by the way, that you yeah. just lost. <laughs> yeah, we can understand I don't know, fear, almost panic, mm -hmm. and, and not because of a lack of trust, let's say, in God. But, I mean, that's a proper response. I imagine a mother who loves her child would understandably feel fear at the prospect of, you know, something went wrong or something could have happened. Right. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of kind of normal human emotions that I think sometimes when we think about Mary being immaculate, we just kind of glaze over, you know, and presume she was immune to kind of worries. Well, or, anxiety, or, right? You know, and, and clearly there was some anxiety. I mean, how? I mean, to be anxious is is to first show that you have concern of something, right? And of course, right. like like anything, any emotion can be taken too far, right? Um, you know, and, and but to to experience these things means that you are a human being, you know, like like also the scripture says, like, OK, you're angry, but let it be without sin. Right. You know, I mean, the, these types of things are uh, always important to continually to, uh, call to mind because uh, so often, you know, we've talked about this many times uh, throughout our lives of the notion of what it is to be holy and yeah. what that looks like. Yeah. You know, many people think of the holy card and the person <laughs> looking pristine. Yeah. And and I am a huge fan of any time 
that we hear about a more robust life of any given saint mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that shows their warts, right. that shows that they had struggles. I mean, we and we know this. It shouldn't shock us right. that St. Paul talks about, you know, that nebulous thorn in his side. What was that? Doesn't matter in a sense because right. he's basically saying there's a flaw in him. That's the way I read it, that he'd like for it to be gone, but the Lord comes to him and says, my grace is sufficient, you know, and it was his, of course, fidelity and trust, you know, um, in, in using him and how many of the the apostles had their own moments, mm-hmm. you know, of, of uh, you know, obviously we always point out Peter, you know, right. yes. um, but he's the easy one to pick out. That's right. But I mean, you also have James and John, you know, yeah. who, who Jesus chastises, calls them sons of thunder. For, yeah for acting a little bit uh, too strongly, and so on and so forth. And the the point is, um, is that we can create for ourselves um, uh, an ideal, you know. And, of course, talking about Jesus and Our Lady is is one thing, Mm -hmm. you know, because obviously Jesus, well, he's God. You know, he's the God-man, you know. So I can't, I can't, you know, get to his level Although that's the level he calls us to, right? He's he's always well, none saying, of us "Are the person of God?" So that's right, you know, that's right. But that's the then we can give barrier. ourselves a pass and think, "Well, you know, it's okay if I slip, you know, now yeah. and then." But then Our Lady, who is fully a creature, but create, you know, immaculately conceived, then then is then we can go and say, "Well, she's immaculately conceived," and so right. she, you know, and that's fair. That that's I, I get that. But at the same time, they they are our models, right? You know, and if I can jump in, I would say something I learned from the Dominicans uh, when I was in seminary in D.C. is that you know her immaculate conception means that Mary's more human than we are. You know, we often associate like a yeah, father. I'm a, you know I'm only human. Yeah, as like well that means I'm a sinner. Right, and it sounds kind of harsh, but the reality is you no know, sin isn't human. I mean, we we know that we talk about people like Hitler, Stalin, right. and, and other tyrants that have been horrible in their actions. And that's the point is that the more sinful you are, the less human you are. And the more human you are, the more the actual holier you are, which gets to uh, a connection I've often talked about in humility and human come from the same root of earth. And for us to be saints, it's not something you know high in the sky, but something very down to earth. And so uh, one of the things I love from Teresa Lisieux when she talks about Mary and her beautiful poem about her, she's more mother than queen. You know, she's more down to earth than always crown and glory right. and very distant from us. That's right. And I find myself time and again kind of in her shoes. I mean, I, if only I were immaculate, but <laughs> in terms of these moments where I, I get confused, as it were, mm. by what God's doing, or I don't grasp all of it. And one of the things that you've mentioned, I think, is helpful for us to remember is that's just so normal. Yes. It's normal in the path to holiness to be befuddled. To not have all the answers as part of mystery is it's not a, a murder mystery, but uh, mystery means that it exceeds all that I can understand at the moment, that there's so much to unpack that some of these things we're going to be contemplating for all eternity and we're never going to go, oh, yeah, you know, God is love done. You know, let me move to the next topic. That's right. Um, but that even with Our Lady's kind of down to earth holiness, you know, she doesn't understand, you know, even with. Uh, many gifts of grace she must have had being immaculate, uh, and yet she's still kind of dumbfounded, as it were. She's still reduced to a certain silence. Uh, and we see with her this growth. You know, that it's John of the Cross talks about this, that Mary also had to grow. Sometimes we forget that because we think, like, sure. she's immaculate, so she was just kind of perfect from birth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but just that she's immaculate doesn't mean that she didn't have to grow. Well, even even, I mean, that's part of the mystery of the God man, the, the incarnate, you know, where uh, it says here that Jesus increased, he grew yeah. in wisdom and stature. Right. Well, you know, again, you know, it's like we gloss over those things. We hear this reading, but we're like, well, how does that work? I mean, that is a mystery. <laughs> yep. That is such a hidden thing. I mean, this is something that that honestly, I mean, the incarnation, right, you know, is is the thing, is the thing. Um, it, it is the the atom bomb, if you will, of of, of human history mm-hmm. that changes and obliterates everything, and we don't even think about it. You know, we go on with our lives, and we think, yeah. you know, that there was this holy man that said some good things, and if you follow most of them, then yeah, you yeah. know, it, no, like he 
literally redid everything. He, as he says, right, I make all things new. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, and, and this, of course, is, is, you know, just us going back and forth here is is our endeavor to do as our lady did which is to to ponder these these mm-hmm. very things mm-hmm. in our own heart even you know, even now as we're speaking you know I'm I have all kinds of you know ideas and, and 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 thoughts that are coming you know some new some old you know mm-hmm. um, and that's that is part of living the joy of the gospel mm-hmm. um, is to be able to to just sit down and we've only been at this for a few minutes and already we're just like this is great you know Anyways, I digress. No, there's a lot to be unpacked uh, from any of these lines of Scripture. I remember St. Gertrude, I read some years ago, said that she could pick any line from Scripture and just chew on it for a long time because each of these lines and each of these words is inspired, is packed with the Holy Spirit. Not only the Holy Spirit inspire the authors, but as we read these words, the Holy Spirit inspires us, as it were. He fills us, which is why reading Scripture is so important because Yes, the sacraments fill us with grace with the Holy Spirit, but also, like I mentioned in the last episode, reading the scriptures, you know, 30 minutes is a plenary indulgence. And not just because, well, we say so. It's, right. it's 30 minutes, as it were, of allowing the Spirit to fill us, you know, to fill us anew. And with that, I want to go back to this idea of that interior activity, you know, to what you talked about with art. We often want results mm. right away. Yeah. And what you mentioned about, you know, there Mary is, you know, Nazareth, and she's watching the God man grow. Yeah. You know? And John Paul II talks about this in Redemptoris Mater. He, he says, you know, it would have required faith for Our Lady because from objective appearances, this is also a young boy and young man who's growing like any other anyone else. I mean, he, he's growing in terms of physical stature, he's growing in his capacity to talk and, and other things. And of course, she remembers what the archangel has said. She believes this is the Messiah. And yet there's this interplay between what's totally human and what's totally divine. I mean, we know from the Gospels, Jesus clearly reveals himself in calming the storm and exorcisms. But there must have been enough ordinariness that that's why the neighbors then complain when he comes home to Nazareth. Like, hey, wait a minute. You're Joseph's son. I mean, we know you. You Who do you think you are coming out and doing all these amazing things? Um and I, I think in terms of what I want with you to be able to share uh, with those who are watching and listening is this ordinariness of Mary's spirituality. Sometimes, you know, we, we've hit at this already now, but we think of holiness and prayer as like this, things separated from daily life. Like sure. We've got to go to adoration. Now, if you can't make it to adoration, of course, go, you know, but um, there's so many moments in life, too, to just pause. You know, I, I've commented to, to you and the other guys here that and I think we have this in our laundry room, the, the painting of Our Lady mm. uh, hanging clothes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a bit anachronistic, probably. I don't think they had dry, uh, right. dry, clo- drying clothes like that back in Jesus's time. But it's a good reminder. You know, Mary did basic things like that. And this is the holiest person, human person ever. And yet keeping it Mary, you know, keeping an attitude of Our Lady is living daily life and seeing it at the mystery of God revealing himself in what otherwise looks like any other ordinary day yeah. uh, where we may not bat an eye and just think, oh, well, you know, normal life. Uh, but the interior activity of Our Lady, this capacity to really hold, and, and perhaps that's where I want to, before we close up for the day, I want to add a, a few theological things out. Yeah is you know the Greek words behind this, I won't get into all the, the terms right now, but it's not just a passive reality. Sometimes, like, if you keep, you know, I have my yerba mate here from Argentina, I can just keep it in my hand. It doesn't require much activity. You know? But uh, when Our Lady keeps the thing in her, in her heart, it's like this idea of, like, mulling it around. Uh, last time, in the last episode, when we were talking, I was thinking about cows, you know, from Texas. So, you know, cows have seven stomachs, so they not only chew the cud, then kind of an ugly image, but they, yep. they, they vomit the cud back into their mouth, <laughs> they chew it more, and then they put it back down again. And that's what the Fathers of the Church actually use as an image for prayer, mm. um, that it's not just about you know, once and being done. You know, like, oh, I, I read the line from Scripture and that's done, but it's this chewing, you know, digesting, and then chewing again, digesting again, and keeping these things, pondering them in our heart is... Active activity. I know it's redundant. Yeah. Um, 
But I think it's an activity we've often lost. Like yeah. You said, because we so focus on the exterior. Uh, and in a scientific age, we don't just want quick explanations. Ask Google, you know, ask Bing, mm. artificial intelligence. We just want answers galore. And what we see with Our Lady is, you know, she didn't have the end of the story. Here she is. She's before God himself and her son. And she doesn't fully grasp, you know, like we said, we just, she doesn't have the end of the story. Yeah. Um, and she has to walk through each day actively participating, not just passively kind of letting these things happen or having someone else tell her what to do. Uh, she's got to really ponder these things in her heart, uh, which, you know, as Marians, we do the 30 minutes of meditation, but also we have moments for examine, uh, the Ignatian examine that goes over the day to review you know, what's gone on in my day, not just examination conscience, you know, what did I do wrong and what do I need to fix, which, you know, can be part of it. Yep. I think there's more to it, and, and what I've learned as a Marian is reviewing each day to be able to see what happened today. You know, beyond just the, the surface, kind of the mystery idea that beyond just what I could, you know, film, you know, like in these videos, you know, what anyone could see, you know, what's under the surface? What is God trying to, to, to get across to me, you know, to others? And that's, that's, I mean, that right there is <clears throat> the most important thing is, um, and probably one of the, the biggest lacking things in our life. It, it can be one thing to look over a year uh, or a month and say, oh, God did this or did that. But to get into the habit of, of kind of going over every single day, mm-hmm. you know, what were those moments where I felt close to God? Mm-hmm. Perhaps the answer is none of those moments. <laughs> I feel close <laughs> to God. And but But even that, like, to one notice the beauty and importance of incorporating that into one's daily life um, is a moment of God poking at the heart, mm-hmm. you know, kind of knocking at the heart, saying, "Would you like me to come in?" You know, right. to to have this kind of dialogue. To so just the very acknowledgement of that is God's grace working in the person um, to even say, "Oh, that is a." something that I probably should incorporate into my day. And that, that's the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the next day you, you try to, to make those you know decisions. Um, okay. At this time of the day, I'm going to stop and just say a Hail Mary, or I'm going to say a, our father, you know, it doesn't take long. I love it. It brought up the image of, of St. Faustina mm-hmm. when Jesus says at the three o'clock hour, I'd like you to, to do the station of the cross. But if you can't do that, then, what does he say? Poke your head into the chapel and say hi. But if you mm-hmm. can't do that, just then pause. Th- he's like, just pause and create yeah. like a chapel within your mm-hmm. heart, just for an instant to reflect on the passion. Yeah, that's it, it. There's not much that's required here. You know, you it's and it's the classic. It's probably cliche. Like you know, we give God a little and He just gives us everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's very true. Yeah. Um. And and it's so easy to to start to enter into this. Uh, deeper relationship with our Lord, with our Lady, yeah. uh, with God the Father, the Holy Spirit, all the saints and angels, and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah, and what you say makes me think of the value of silence, you know, to be able to <laughs> notice what God is doing. Uh, when I was in the Philippines, I, I laughed because uh, I learned that from the Filipinos, their culture, they they all talk at once. So we, if they were here in the podcast uh, they would all be talking at once into their microphones <laughs> instead of back and forth like a dialogue. And I thought, I don't know how anyone can understand this, but they seem to get along well. Um, but we need the silence to be able to decipher what is the voice, because there's so many voices, you know, sure. our own voices, yeah. voices of others. And it's not bad, but Our Lady and being able to enter into like God knocking, you know, in this moment of finding Jesus in the temple and saying like, it doesn't seem like things are computing, you know, but being able to hold these things in our heart creates a space of silence that instead of just adding more and trying to fix and change and figure out and control, which we often try to do because when we're anxious and we're reading a, a book in psychology when we're anxious, what do we tend to do? We want to grab on to control, to, to fix it, to, uh, to take care of our anxiety, which often creates even more problems. <laughs> but there's a, a beautiful phrase from Pope Benedict, and I'll put, try to put these in the, the show notes because there's a lot yes. of notes I have here that... Yep. Too much for me to read all in one episode, but uh, if I get the Latin correct, verbo crescente, verba deficiunt, which means as the one word grows, then the words, plural, fall away, become silent. Mm-hmm. 
and I think it's a beautiful play on words there, no pun intended, <laughs> that you know, as we listen and meditate on the one word, all the other words from the world and, and temptations they begin to, to, to kind of fall away. And in this time of Advent, you know, St. Faustina, turning to Our Lady in the diary, asked, what do I do to prepare for the coming of Jesus? And Our Lady emphasized silence, silence, silence. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to literally say nothing each day. Right. Faustina says, actually, we can break our silence by not speaking when we should. But uh, there's so much noise. And, and I think that for a lot of us, it's necessary to imitate Our Lady in this interior activity and, and silence, not just not saying anything, but the silence of surrender. Yeah. Uh, not taking control, not always having to figure it out, because sometimes the more we try to figure it out, the less we understand as we complicate it more. Well, in adopting that silence, uh, just as you were saying with, with, Mary's disposition to keep these things and ponder them in her heart, it's not a passive thing, is it? Right. You know, like silence, there's there is an activity right. to listening, you know, to to observing. Um and what came to mind too is is uh I remember reading well, hearing Peter Crave, but reading in some of his books as well, um, how he once mused, uh, probably many times, that if more people would just go in silence and stare at the ocean. <laughs> that the world would be so much better. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's a if you've ever had the opportunity to just sit on a beach, you know, especially as the sun is setting or rising, mm -hmm. um, and just stare and have no distractions but just to look at the beauty, um, then you get that statement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's of course so many things. I mean, I love to just go out in the woods, you know, like uh and and just listen to mm -hmm. to all the animals, you know, and and um and just focus in on each and every one. But that pausing in, in our daily life to go ahead and, you know, uh, <clears throat> just observe, you know, mm -hmm. not just what's visibly around us with our eyes, but yeah. that the Lord is showing us uh, with the eyes of, of faith. Yeah. And that's what contemplation, sometimes we think of contemplation like this, you know, levitating in the air, <laughs> special saints have it. Monks but, out in the you know, you know, Tibetan, you know. <laughs> but contemplation is exactly what you're talking about. It's just letting reality kind of sink into us, being yeah. able to just observe. Mm. And, you know, I've studied a lot of psychology, so a lot of things are going off in my mind, but uh, I'll probably try to practice silence myself because <laughs> we <laughs> go into a whole other episode. I know. But um, I'll, I'll practice that silence now and just say that it's been a joy talking with you next time to make a segue. Uh, we'll share our own stories because you mentioned how sometimes we hear the Lord kind of knocking on our hearts. And we've been talking about the mysteries that mm -hmm. Mary went through. That's right. Uh, and we pray the mysteries of Christ's life in the rosary. But in one sense, the rosary also encourages us to meditate on our own mysteries, the ways that God's acted in our lives and how he's tried to communicate with us. So uh, in the next two episodes, we'll go through our vocational stories and the ways that we've experienced God entering our lives and how we've been able, thanks be to God, to actually respond and be here and to share Keeping It Marian with you as Marians of the Immaculate Conception. That's right. We've explained, at least we've tried to explain what we're hoping to do yeah. uh, with this joint venture. Um, but now, of course, we're, we're hoping in the next two episodes to kind of give people an understanding of our own backgrounds, but also what God is doing, you know, in our lives and, and to kind of show why we have uh, different ways of seeing certain things. 